Welcome to another episode of Tank Talks, your personal think tank for all things startups and venture capital. I'm your host, Matt Cohen, founder and managing partner at Ripple Ventures. On today's show, we are talking about embedded fintech as the new SaaS 3.0 with founder and managing partner of Shine Capital, Mo Koifman. Mo is a prolific venture capitalist who started his career investing at IAC, working underneath Barry Diller, one of the greatest investors of all time. At IAC, Mo saw firsthand how companies were using software to solve their own problems and then expanded to new markets starting with payments and billings. Mo led acquisition for IAC and companies like Vimeo while also acting as COO for a period of time. Mo later moved on to Spark Capital in 2008, where he led investments in companies like Skillshare, Warby Parker, Plaid, and several others. After leaving Spark in 2016, Mo eventually launched his new fund, Shine Capital, with $125 million in funding in the fall of 2020. On today's show, we asked Mo for his views on the emergence of embedded fintech and how all the companies Mo backed early on, like Plaid, have gone on to change the direction of so many other startups. We get Mo to explain what he looks for when backing early stage founders trying to tackle legacy industries like banking and payments, and where he's looking to place his bets now with his new fund. But before we get started today, I wanted to share some exciting news for us at Tank Talks. Some of our listeners may know that I started my professional career at Royal Bank of Canada, fresh out of college on the equity sales and trading desk back in 2007. My time at RBC, both in Toronto and down on Wall Street, New York, were instrumental in providing me with incredible opportunities in the capital markets industry. Now, several years later, I am proud to announce that Ripple Ventures and Tank Talks have partnered with RBCX to support visionary technology entrepreneurs across the US and Canada. With the recent launch of RBCX, founders and startups are now able to access a full service platform to accelerate their entrepreneurial journey at every stage of growth. With not only access to innovative capital solutions, products and services, the team at RBCX is offering solutions for technology clients across their entire company lifecycle, from inception to IPO and beyond. The amazing team led by Sid Paquette, along with Nicole Kelly and Anthony Muchentoff, are well known in the startup ecosystem, and we couldn't be more excited to partner with them on Tank Talks. Listeners of Tank Talks can get set up with an intro meeting with one of RBCX's team members by visiting rbcx.com and mentioning Tank Talks to get set up today. Now let's get into this week's episode with Mo Koifman, founder and managing partner of Shine Capital. Thanks for joining us in the Tank today, Mo. It's absolutely my pleasure. As you already know, Mo, today about 90% of public SaaS companies have some form of subscription-based revenue model. Nowadays, with all the new fintech infrastructure available like Stripe and Plaid, companies have made it possible for SaaS businesses to add financial services alongside their core software product offerings. By adding fintech, SaaS businesses can increase revenue sometimes as much as five times and open up new SaaS markets that previously may not have been accessible due to a smaller software market or inefficient customer acquisition. Mo, I'd love to kick things off with hearing your definition of embedded fintech and how you have seen it evolve as the new SaaS since you began your career first at IAC with Barry Diller and then at Spark Capital as a partner. It's funny, you know, it's been a journey for me to get here and I feel like everything I do in my life is just continuing to pull on a string. You know, as you mentioned, I started my career at IAC. Actually, I started my career at Bear Stearns, may she rest in peace, before heading over to IAC, which was called USA Networks. Uh, Now I'm dating myself at the time that I joined. But, you know, I I worked for Barry Diller there for six years. He used to refer to it as uh, putting one dumb foot in front of the other, where, you know, if if you look at what IAC has become over time, sort of a publicly traded private equity firm, uh, private equity slash VC firm of sorts, or slash incubator, I should say, of sorts. It didn't get there by following a straight line. It, it Barry would tug on the string or put one dumb foot in front of the other, as he would say, uh, following his passions and his curiosities. And it would le- initially it led to the internet as the fundamentally transformative platform for our generation. And so he pulled on that string for a little bit, and we bought a whole bunch of assets between some before I joined, some during uh, my, my time there, and some after. But while I was there, it was sort of between end of 01, 02 to 08 was really the, the height of our acquiring businesses. And um, we bought every company you could possibly imagine, every vertical business you could imagine across uh, commerce, uh, online subscription businesses around dating, online travel. And, it, you know, this was my first exposure to fintech, 
we bought Lending Tree, uh, and I'm still quite close with Doug Labdo, the CEO uh, there, and worked very closely with them on m and I would call that FinTech 1.0, where it was a vertical, really a lead gen offering that has since broadened and deepened what it does uh, horizontally and vertically, respectively. Um, and that was sort of my first exposure to uh, FinTech, call it, or 1.0 FinTech. From there, um, I ended up falling in love with the early stage at IAC. Um, so what happened at IAC is we ended up buying all these businesses, including some early fintech businesses. And then Barry was sitting there with this massive portfolio of businesses, $70 billion of enterprise value, trying to figure out how do I tie all these things together? And I think he got to a place where he realized they don't all tie together. And so we ended up spinning out a bunch of these businesses, including Lending Tree and the travel business under the Expedia moniker uh, and the dating business under Match, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that became sort of the model for IAC. So Barry pulled on the string. It led to an accumulation of assets. Then it led to a spinning off in a very tax efficient manner assets. And now that's become sort of the playbook for IAC. So for me, that was where I had my first FinTech, FinTech 1.0 experience. And in my own sort of pull it, pulling on the string, putting one dumb foot in front of the other, at the end of my time, last couple few years of, of my time at IAC, as the market got really, really expensive leading up to the 08 crisis, we started to turn our attention towards earlier stage businesses, notably Vimeo, which I was quite involved with both buying and helping hire a team and uh, articulate a strategy and go to market. It was really one of the early freemium software businesses on the web. And I really fell in love with that process and continue to put you know, my feet in front of the other and, and decided that I wanted to go into venture capital and early stage company building full time, which is what I did. That landed me at Spark, um, a firm that I'd known since they were raising their first fund through some mutual uh, connections, LP connection, actually. And at Spark, I continued to pull on this fintech string. Namely, I started to look at a lot of these what I would call still fintech 1.0 businesses, whether they were lending businesses, uh, both consumer lending businesses, B2, B2B lending businesses, you know, remember the era of on deck and lending club effectively, which were they were kind of they were trying to to move to the fintech 2.0 world, but we're still very much traditional balance sheet fintech businesses. And, and what happened was, as I was realizing how difficult it was for those businesses to deliver compelling onboard, onboarding experiences and ongoing experiences with their constituents, with their customers, it led me ultimately to invest in a little company called Plaid that you mentioned earlier, which effectively was trying to solve the problem of interfacing with the existing financial infrastructure to unlock fintech on a more global scale. I don't know if you recall, you know, the penny deposit era where anytime you wanted to sign up to one of those early fintech apps and link a bank account, which is what is required for this next generation of finance or fintech 2.0, right? Fintech 1.0 with lending tree, et cetera, some of these businesses, they didn't require deep integration into your underlying financial services infrastructure, even take an E-Trade or Schwab, et cetera. You go there, you'd set up an account, and even depositing money, even though it was a pain in the butt, it's like once you got the money in there, it was sort of a, a closed system. Lending Tree was helping you find mortgages, you were doing your trading on E-Trade. But if you wanted true fintech interoperability as a core part of what you were trying to do, both in terms of onboarding, but then delivering services, it just didn't exist. So most of the experiences that we were looking at and that we were seeing built, and this is going back to 2011, 2012, like really early days, like the only person I I know that was doing fintech investing as a thing is Matt Harris at Bain. And at the time he was at Village Ventures. I bring him up. He's top of mind. We had dinner this week and it was, I was saying to him, it was funny. It was like, you've been talking about fintech. You were talking about fintech and investing in fintech for a decade before it was even a thing. Like people didn't know what you were talking about until all of a sudden, all of a sudden the world came your way. And it is companies like Plaid and Stripe that unlocked this possibility, Stripe in payments and Plaid in terms of connecting to existing financial infrastructure. So 
frankly, my journey to this new wave of fintech, we're calling fintech 3.0 now, really came through 1.0, then trying to move to 2.0 and realizing that we couldn't do it without tying into the infrastructure. That led me to leading Spark Seed Investment and taking a board seat at Plaid for the first, I think, four years I was on the board. That has proven to be my most successful investment to date and 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 Sparks as well. And having a front row seat for what Plaid unlocked um, in the ecosystem sort of led me to this new wave, which we're talking about now, which is, okay, now that we've linked the online ecosystem to the offline ecosystem in a way where you can deliver payments, banking as a service, all kinds of financial products, lending, factoring, et cetera, in a truly seamless way with a user experience that resonates for whether it's for consumers or businesses, you can now start to think about what do we do with those services? Because now we could take them out of their own walled gardens and we can distribute them more broadly or leverage them more broadly in the context of an API-driven and SDK-driven world. And actually, Matt, who I mentioned before, uh, helped articulate some of this publicly and some of the pieces that he's written as well. Um, But around the same time, I started to think about gosh, how do we now take the financial infrastructure that we've helped build and embed it in and leverage it in some of these other verticals and other areas that were just too hard to to penetrate previously? Because to your point, you couldn't sell these folks. They were too hard to reach. You could never get the CAC to LTV right. Because, you know, you either couldn't charge enough or you were charging too much or, you know, they weren't ready for technology or whatever the case may be. But now in a world where software is the norm and COVID has accelerated this dramatically for every single industry, they're now starting, everybody is starting to use software, whether it's in, you know, we haven't talked about this publicly yet, so so we won't, I won't go into it here, but like a deal we've done together in trucking or something we just did in local government or something we're looking at in construction or I can go down the list of these really, really uh, large offline for the most part historically verticals with massive TAMs and market being, you know, business being done in a very offline or rudimentary technology sort of way. So now that there's an appetite for more software, which we're starting to see because when everybody was home during the pandemic, first of all, they had no choice. And also as a new generation of people come into these industries, they are used to all the productivity tools that we all work with all day, every day. And they want to see them in their workplace not just at home. Could you imagine going from like Gmail and Slack and Superhuman at home with your buddies and then you're working in like a Microsoft Office instance with VPN? It's just, it's just like you're not used to it and you don't want to be doing it. And so, um, so that's really what has emerged now where software is now eating every corner of the world. And what you can do given that finance and, and fintech is so networked, both across the fin- digital fintech ecosystem and to the the, the offline um, and traditional finance system that it needs to link to, you can now start thinking about, well, well how can we bring this fintech uh, infrastructure that we've built and capability that we've built natively into some of these industries where money is moving, Lending is happening. Factoring is a core part of doing business. But for the most part, it's all happening through traditional invoicing, traditional factoring, traditional banking. Well, what if we took the digital rails that we've built now and integrate them into the software that is now being adopted, even in the most laggard industries, because of both necessity and the aging down of the worker population? What can we do if we start marrying fintech to software? And that's really sort of both my journey to this on a personal level and what uh, and 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 how it maps to you know what has happened in terms of the evolution of fintech and financial infrastructure in an open and accessible way on the web that now makes embeddable finance 
um, such an interesting part about the future of uh, such an interesting part of the future of software, and it gives you a new lens through which to look at markets and to underwrite businesses that actually completely changes the cost, revenue, CAC, LTV dynamics of those businesses as you unpack the opportunities here. That's really amazing to hear you talk about your journey from the very early days, you know, after leaving Bear Stearns and going in with Barry Diller at IAC and going after sort of this industry. And I wouldn't even call it FinTech at the time when you were sort of scratching the surface or trying to peel back the layer of the onion with it, because you were just looking for problems that needed better solutions, like all technology companies hopefully start it with. And you guys found the traditional fit financial services that were tech empowered by providing a digital framework to their existing offline businesses like LendingTree, but they were still confined to that walled garden of where they could operate because of all the legacy walls that they had to uh, break through, which is where a lot of these companies like Stripe and Plaid came out of. They saw a problem, which you saw firsthand before the guys at Stripe and Plaid probably saw the problem. And then you were able to say, yes, I've experienced that problem. Now I'm going to find the solution that's best suited for it and bet on that. And then, then you saw what happened with Stripe and Plaid being on the board there and what you got experience at Vimeo being the COO and, and operating on the board as well to see what problems you can combine with the solutions that were being offered from other portfolio companies. And that is exactly why I love investing in technology companies because you have no idea which path you're going to be taken down. But you know, as long as you start scratching the surface at more and more problems, you will eventually find more and more solutions. And it's just a rabbit hole that never ends until this day where you are now at Shine Capital, right? Exactly. I mean, that's that's what I, I am an innately curious person. I'm always looking to find the answers to questions that I'm asking myself or that, uh, that are being asked that in, intrigue me. And I really learned how to harness that in a business context from Barry Diller, who was literally like if I had to describe Barry in a, in a, in a couple of words, I would say he's relentlessly curious. Like he just is never satisfied and always pulling on the string and what's next and where's it going and how can we get in front of it? And, and when you combine that with being incredibly savvy and understanding leverage and where you have leverage and where you don't, I mean, it's why he has been one of the savviest uh, uh, deal makers in history. Um, and so I have uh, learned a lot from that and it matches sort of my innate curiosity. And I have just been pulling on these threads in my career. And to, to, to your point on the Plaid founders, actually, you know, when I sat down with William and Zach in, I think it was 2012 or maybe 13, they were coming at the problem in the same way that I was. So I had done a couple of fintech investments and we had done a few as a firm and like, it was just really hard to get customer adoption. It was just linking a bank account was so difficult. Interfacing with it was so difficult. It was just, you know, the ideas were there, but the infrastructure was simply not in place to execute on those ideas, to move from the sort of digital enablement of financial services to entirely new digital financial services. And when the Platt guys came to me, what was so interesting is they actually came to it the same way. So I don't know, you know, a lot of folks know this because they've told this story before, but not everyone does. But actually, William and Zach were originally working on a PFM, a personal financial management product, which was sort of a mint 2.0. And that's what led them to found Plaid, which was they simply could not build the consumer experience they wanted to build, given that the infrastructure to link to the underlying financial system wasn't in place to do so. And so they were pulling on a string. And that led them to say, you know what? this is actually a bigger problem to solve. And we can solve it not just for the PFM that we wanted to build, but for any financial product that anyone needs to wants to dream up in the future, we can abstract all of the infrastructure required kind of in the way that AWS did it for, you know, you go down a level to server infrastructure. They're doing it for financial infrastructure. Stripe did it for payments infrastructure and allow engineers, developers, entrepreneurs to focus on delivering the financial services that they want to deliver to consumers. 
fast forward today, right, to what we want to talk about, which is embedded fintech. Now, Plaid and Stripe and others have provided the infrastructure to enable all of these incredible financial services to be built for consumers and businesses. And we don't need to go through them here. We all know what they are. The emergent fintech ecosystem has been just unbelievable um, over the past almost a decade now, but not quite. Call it seven, eight years, seven, eight years of true explosive innovation. So now folks like, like myself and you are saying, okay, we've worked in software, we've worked in fintech, well, is there a way to put these two things together now that the infrastructure for delivering software into the, the, the hardest industries to break into, the, the least tech-savvy industries, now software is penetrating trucking and construction and government, et cetera. Now can we bring fintech into those ecosystems as well? And you know what reminds me of, interestingly, which I, I don't know how many folks who listen to this will go back this far. So again, I'm dating myself, but it sort of reminds me a little bit of the cable business back in the day. So when I came out of school and I was at Bear Stearns, I was doing a lot of cable work, both MSOs um, and cable networks. And the beauty of the cable network business model was that it had a dual revenue stream. They were both ad supported and there were subscription fees. So the way the cable systems work, as you know, is they charge consumers for cable television at the time, and they would then pay each of the networks some portion of that of those subscription fees that they were getting from their subscribers and they would keep some obviously for their margin and ESPN would get the most and you know some of the longer tail channels would get the least and there would be bundling and all this other stuff but the economic model for those cable nets in those early days was so extremely powerful because they would get this subscription revenue effectively from the um the MSOs from the cable providers, which would cover their costs and make them some money. And then they'd get all the leverage as they scaled on the advertising dollars, right? The more, the more eyeballs they touched, the more ads they could sell. So for me, that's, that's the pattern recognition is I'm now looking at these software businesses that are selling into these legacy industries, these, these deeper in the, um, in the stack B2B industries and often, you know, even government, for instance, which is obviously a slower mover, even than some of the most old school industries across North America and globally. And you're selling them software, but you also understand that the software that you're selling them sits in between buyers and sellers of goods and services who already have, in many instances, pre-existing financial relationships with each other where there's there's working capital financing that's happening embedded in that value chain there are payments moving back and forth in that value chain there are different kinds of factoring in that value chain there's all sorts of lending attached to it and it turns out that if you can embed yourself in the center of one of those industries where you're connecting buyers and sellers initially, you can also begin to connect other financial participants in that ecosystem or even bring your own financial participants to that ecosystem. And you now have the opportunity for a dual revenue stream, right? You can sell your software and maybe you can sell it at a price that is less than you would have to sell it at if that was your only revenue stream. So it doesn't. It ha- you have to sell it for enough that it is valued by the buyer, but you don't have to push pricing so hard that you invite competition into your market. Again, very smart way to maintain your competitive barriers in that business. And you could begin to put yourself into the payments flow and potentially use Stripe or whatever the case may be, to start offering a more streamlined and more interesting payment solution. You can begin to leverage Plaid data and third-party lenders or balance sheet providers to start integrating factoring or working capital finance or whatever the case is in there, all of which you could begin to collect 
money on and to earn fees on because you were facilitating that transaction. It allows a dual revenue stream that in my mind is better for everyone in the ecosystem. So even though you're making money on both, you're actually saving the buyers and the sellers time. You're delivering them a beautiful experience that um, is far beyond what they're used to working on. In many instances, it's pen and paper. And you're bringing the transaction into the workflow, which is actually where you want it at the end of the day anyways. And so to me, that is what FinTech 3.0 is and what we've been so excited about at Shine and where we've placed a number of bets so far is software in very large marketplaces, typically B2B marketplaces that have yet to be innovated on or have yet to transform to modern software workflow. And where we are embedding financial services early on in those businesses, it's not a, oh, we'll get to a scale and then we'll do fintech. No, no, no. It is core of what we do because it is delivering value to the stakeholders and the constituents there in a way that actually is delightful to them. And that is, we are over the next five to seven years, I suspect we will see every single B2B value chain globally be uh, infiltrated with the combination of workflow software and financial services Uh, where what has happened on the consumer side is now going to happen on the business side and in some of the deepest, most entrenched and reluctant to change industries in the world. That's amazing. I mean, first off, thanks for sharing your whole career history, learning from Barry Diller, one of the greatest investors of all time. We could have a whole other podcast on that. And then watching the guys at Plaid go through that pivot and seeing a problem that they were trying to solve on top of building their existing, you know, kind of Mint 2.0. We see a lot of companies have that problem, right? That's how Slack got started. That's how Shopify got started when they were trying to figure out how to sell their snowboards online. And that's even how one of our portfolio companies, VoiceFlow, got started when they were trying to learn how to build skills on Alexa themselves. They had to learn how to build their own drag and drop, you know, editor for them to be able to create conversational AI tools. So a lot of companies get started that way. But let's double click on some of the bets that you're making in this space. You know, you've just said there are now companies that can go from reselling to now being fully embedding those services into their offerings. But there's also another added benefit, which is this idea of lowering your CAC while increasing LTV, which is a new phenomenon to the SaaS world, as typically LTV has remained relatively the same unless SaaS prices were increasing over time. But now with the addition of fintech offerings, companies are able to dramatically increase their LTV. Can you share some examples of this in companies you've worked with and how it dramatically changed their business model? To be candid, there aren't that many that I can talk to specifically that have done this at scale yet, because I actually don't think very many have done it at scale. I think you actually see this more. So for example, Shopify, you mentioned, has done a really, look, their partnership with a firm is very instructive here, right? Where they incorporated the buy now, pay later functionality into their offering. You know, Shopify is a payments platform, is an e-commerce platform and payments business at the core. And they've been able to to incorporate other financial products around that at scale that generate them incremental dollars. Trying to think if there's anything in our portfolio that I can talk about that has done that well at scale yet. Well, there's the mind, body, and toast examples of companies that have added on that sort of payments layer to their existing SaaS subscription offering, which has been extremely successful for companies like that. Well, I guess that's true. I guess those businesses were um, were less payment focused at the beginning, um, although I don't remember the history as well. The reason I think it's hard to pick examples of this is because you're right. There were cer- there were some companies that started as software workflow tools then incorporated payments. But those are actually the companies that started 
pre-stripe and plaid being as prolific as they are. And then as those companies came into existence, they incorporated in. So we we have to go a bit back in time. And, and in terms of shine, we started investing this fall in earnest. So the reason we don't have companies that started as software and then added payments is because we're telling our companies to to build the payments flow directly into the product from day one, rather than do it in this two-pronged approach. We believe, and by the way, the way we're doing it is we're saying, you don't have to force every single one of your customers to mo- to use your payments module, but you should make your payments module available to every one of your customers. And then you can do the same with factoring or working capital or whatever uh, additional financial product you want to offer on top of it. So today, the company Companies that I'm seeing doing this are doing it from inception, where they're actually building the financial services componentry, typically payments being part one, into the business in its early days, rather than saying, let's build the software piece and then add payments. And and it's precisely for the reason that you mentioned. If you build financial services, if it's if it's part and parcel of the SaaS product that you're offering, you can look at revenues and model revenues quite differently, which gives you a totally different allowable in terms of how much can you spend to acquire and onboard that customer. So again, companies that have started in software and added fintech, there are definitely good examples of them, and you've mentioned some. But those were largely companies that scaled prior to the proliferation of these tools and then realized that they can add it to their offering. Whereas today, I think you're seeing the the entrepreneurs um, build payments into their workflow from day zero, in my experience. What about you? Is that what you're seeing as well? Or are you seeing more of a two-step approach uh, with the companies that you're looking at? I think, you know, payments is an easy thing for people to to start off with. You know, we're seeing some companies do a bit of a, like, you can pay, or we'll offer you this, but it's not really being shoved down on customers' throat, which is exactly what you're saying. But what I'd love to ask you about is, like, some of the risks that are associated with this sort of expansion of embedded fintech, maybe too early. You know, let's not kid ourselves into thinking that by adding all these embedded services and offerings is happening with just a flip of a button, right? There are significant costs associated with bringing on uh, support teams uh, to offer these kinds of services. What risk do you see startups miscalculating when deciding which services to offer internally? And how do you suggest they analyze which areas to expand to next after obviously starting with payments? The thing that I've learned about financial services over the years and where I've made mistakes really comes down to balance sheet businesses versus non-balance sheet businesses. I I, I don't, I actually think that embedding payments is pretty low risk today. It can be hard to, to change behavior in terms of how people pay today. I don't know that there's incremental risk there per se, uh, that is too tough to, to navigate. And By the same token, if what you're talking about doing is basically being a fintech router of sorts or a wrapper where you can plug in lending and you can plug in working capital financing or factoring or whatever the case may be, again, less risk there in the sense that what you're doing is you're taking pretty well-trodden Uh, components of a particular industry, and you're trying to enmesh yourself as sort of a gatekeeper there, or the software system of record, I should say, so that you end up forcing those players, and forcing's a a heavy-handed word, it's not what I mean, you end up sort of allowing, inviting uh, those players to participate in that system of record. And frankly, you make their workflow and their jobs easier as well. Like at some point, those lenders, they are, they're a constituent, they're a stakeholder of yours as well. And trust me, the way they're interfacing for the most part with their customers is suboptimal as well. And you can be a full system of record for all of those constituents and constituencies, which makes the execution of all of that Um, much more seamless for everyone. And you can take a VIG on that and everybody's happy that you are. Where I see 
fintech companies go awry and where I think you're going to see founders in this new SaaS 2.0 embedded fintech kind of play, I think you're going to see a bunch of businesses um, get in the balance sheet game again and learn the very tough lessons of um, what can happen when you're in a balance sheet business and you have a shock, a macro shock to the economy and how um, balance sheet businesses get valued uh, ultimately at the end of the day. If you are a true, if you are a true balance sheet lender and not considered a payments company, and this is where the a firm after pay Klarna's of the world have sort of threaded a needle and are perceived more as a payments business uh, by the market, just given how quickly funds turn than a true balance sheet lender. You're going to end up really compressing your ultimate multiple and putting yourself in harm's way in terms of an exogenous shock to the economy. And I, I have heard numerous, you know, SaaS embedded fintech founders talk about becoming lenders and offering their own factoring. And that's where I would I would really, really caution folks and where I think there is a lot of room for uh, greed and and avarice and mistakes uh, around that, which is, you know, I've been burned by balance sheet businesses on a pure standalone basis. Forget about the fact that you're doing it in conjunction with this high growing, high value software business where you don't want to kill the golden goose and the golden multiple that'll come with it. I think the pull to go faster, to capture more of the lending margin is very strong and founders often uh, see that as a shiny object, but that comes with regulatory regimes, balance sheet requirements, uh, larger macroeconomic concerns that you have to be careful with, and potential valuation compression at the end of the day that is typically never worth the trade. And so, so far, that's where folks, you know, their eyes get a little bigger than their stomachs in this regard, so to speak, and they don't realize what they're going to have to choke down to become a lender and whether that's actually a good idea for their business. So, so far, that's the, 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 the carrot that folks sometimes um, get excited by that I would caution very strongly against doing. And there, there's lots of different ways to do it in terms of being, as I said before, a router for some of these businesses. It's definitely a lower take, but a much higher margin with, with no risk as compared to being a lender. And, you know, there could be ways to spin up or partner with or help launch a lending business or whatever the case may be that is capitalized in a slightly different way. You know, you have to be very um, thoughtful about beginning to take capital risk. So it's one thing to be an embedded fintech player. It's another thing to turn yourself into a financial institution. And you, I think I think I would, enc I would encourage these businesses to uh, avoid that temptation, even though the amount of dollars that you can move through the system in that regard can be very tempting. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's just dive into this because I've been thinking about this a lot, Mo. You know, you've got the clear codes of the world who have much higher cost of capital than, let's say, like, you know, borrowing from the, the window uh, at the U.S. Federal Reserve. And they're going out and sort of lending about billions of dollars to startups. And then you've got like the credit card space also, where everyone in the tech world knows the Brexes of the world and the ramps who just raised, you know, $300 million financing at almost a $4 billion valuation to build out their credit card offering. Companies are offering virtual and physical credit cards left, right, and center, with all of them competing for this wallet share within this high growth tech customer segment. With so many of these companies fighting on offerings for the best rates to compete on interchange fees on the transactions, where do you see this segment of the market ending up or is it just a race to the bottom? I don't think it's a race to the bottom. If you look at both Brex and Ramp, and actually if you look at Amex before that, you'll see that the corporate card business um, is not a pure interchange play, but it is about owning a very, very valuable relationship with a business. Um, if you go back to Amex and their corporate card business, um, they offered all kinds of 
um, goods, uh, all kinds of services and rewards and travel and all kinds of different things around their corporate card offering as part of a suite of services that they're offering to the small business customer and even to the larger business customer. When you look at Brex and Ramp, you'll already see in the moves that they've been making that they don't view themselves as pure credit card players who are going to make their money on interchange in perpetuity. So for example, Brex already started charging for a premium service of, of their offering, not dissimilar to what Amex has done for years in terms of charging for the level of participation in their premium services. They also launched a venture debt business where you can see that what they're doing is Brex has clearly staked out the longer, they're going at Amex's SMB business, whereas Ramp is going at I think they're doing everything between SMBs and enterprise with a different offering. They're sort of cutting the market differently. Brex is all SMBs, all tech forward businesses so far, offering them credit cards, but also premium services, as well as now lending and other ser- other things they can offer. They want to be they want to beat Amex small business with a holistic bundle of services that they can offer that small small business where they're not simply competing on interchange and you're not simply shopping as a small business customer on rate alone, right? They're now packaging, bundling, widening their service offering. If you look at Ramp, similar but a different approach. So Ramp didn't it has gone after larger customers than Brex. They've gone after smaller ones as well, but they are offering a card. They are now starting to offer spend management tools more broadly, right? They're starting to think about how they capture more spend from those businesses and they're competing more with the core Amex offering around, you know, that's the, the upmarket offering for Amex. And so even in their in their recent financing announcements. Uh, the Brex announced their credit uh, lending business, their venture lending business this week. Ramp announced uh, a spend management acquisition in, in, con- in conjunction with their financing. You're starting to see that they know that it's a losing battle. Yes, if everybody was just offering cards and everybody was competing on rates, it's definitionally a race to the bottom. Once Amex or whomever reaches parity. Like in the beginning, Ramp and Brex are going to be much better for a certain kind of company that wants an easier onboarding, tech enabled, digital first experience because they're competing with Amex and JPM and all these big bank card providers who just simply don't offer that. So they can win, by the way, even if they're not at the absolute best rate necessarily, although they're doing it at pretty compelling rates where they can compete head on. Um, If it was a pure rate game, I think you're right. It would be a race to the bottom, but we've seen with the legacy players and we've seen with the new players, they're already thinking about customer segmentation differently. And they're thinking about horizontal expansion of their offerings differently, whereby they're going to be viewed as a package rather than purely as a, you know, am I getting the best rate from my corporate card provider? No, it kind of goes back to your sort of cocktail TV situation. You're saying only relationship right from the beginning and then layer on other services to extend the value of the LTV indefinitely once you get a relationship built out early on with your customers, which is what Brex and Ramp and these players are doing is what you're saying, right? Right. So what I'm saying is they um, went after the customer with a more tech forward, product led, modern business card offering, which in and of itself will pull a lot of customers away or get a lot of new customers that might have otherwise used Amex or whatever it was to their platform. And and then from there, they continue to add more and more services around that so that what they're offering is not simply a better priced card. That's a, that's a losing proposition, but a suite of services that really works for this for this generation of businesses, including a a well-priced, very flexible spending card, but that incorporates a whole bunch of other elements uh, to their business. No, that makes total sense. You know, what one area I'm really excited about that I'd love to get your take on, Mo, is the move towards embedded services on the infrastructure side in areas like payroll and taxes, 
for compliance checks and benefits. What are your thoughts on these additional services being embedded in startup offerings and how do you think it will play out? It's funny you should mention that because I was just going down the rabbit hole on tax today, but I think they will play out quite similarly to how we've seen this ecosystem play out more generally. Namely, um, there are going to be companies that wrap a tax offering or whatever the case may be and make that available as a service to consumers through other businesses Um, I think the trick here is figuring out which of those API-led, componentized offerings, financial offerings as a service, are going to be uh, the most valuable. Which teams are going and which teams are going to build the best ones and try and you know pick out the, the the needles from the haystack, so to speak. But there will be other services beyond payments and bank inf- and, and financial infrastructure. Uh, like you're already seeing it with like, you know, alloys doing it with KYC AML. You're starting to see some players doing it in taxes. Like people have taken what Plaid has done and are trying to do it in other areas. By the way, I think that Plaid is going to continue to expand the aperture and they have a war chest and will continue to expand on that to do that. Not just uh, building, but also they may be an aggressive acquirer over time of some of these more verticalized solutions so that they can offer a more full stack approach to startups. And they've already done that, right? Like they started with one offering and they've been continuing to productize more and more and more. And they will go out and buy or build um, additional components here. But I think we will see a number of these break through as big standalone businesses and either go public or get bought for big numbers uh, if they're able to carve up a vertical that is it has to be complex enough and there has to be enough fragmentation on both the supply and the demand side whereby they could sort of do enough on the supply and on the aggregation and on the service offering side, you know, where it becomes difficult to replicate. Some of these you see, and it's definitely a valuable service, but it's not it's very easily replicable. Like, you know, they're not doing enough. There's not, there aren't enough data moats or I don't want to say data moats. There isn't a network effect or some value to the data network or um, some reality where the more they are used in the ecosystem, the more valuable they get. And that's why it becomes more difficult for competition to emerge. So I think the trick with these businesses is finding an area where you can deliver something in this way that's you know packaged up via API to be embedded by you know soft by businesses by web based businesses all over the place, but where there are true barriers to what you are doing as you scale. I mean, I'm really excited about this, and it kind of goes back to the beginning of your career at IAC. I mean, look how long it's taken for some of these fintechs to really take off. And now we're just starting to break down those walled gardens around taxes and compliance and benefits only because of all the other barriers that have been broken down by guys at Stripe and Plaid and so on. So I agree with you. It's going to be very exciting. I think it will play out the same way. You know, I'd love to switch gears and talk about your new $125 million fund that you mentioned closed last fall. What kind of investments are you focused on and where are you placing bets on the embedded fintech ecosystem today? We are a generalist early stage firm. Our focus really is on leading or take or leading, co-leading or taking meaningful positions in institutional seed and series A rounds of companies. So we're talking about writing our smallest check is a million and a half to two million bucks in a seed that we're very passionate about, all the way up to call it eight eight ish million bucks in this fund, you know, for fun two and beyond, we'd probably go to 10 or more depending on, on where we end up. But constraints are the mother of invention, so to speak. Uh, and I, you know, the, a lot of the best advice I've gotten in my venture capital career, uh, has come from my mentor in the business, Fred Wilson, um, who is, has really, um, you know, has taught me a lot over the years, but one of the things he's, he taught me at the beginning 
is just how keeping your fund relatively small as compared to what all of the big platforms are doing, if, if you want to be an early stage investor, is just a very powerful constraint for forcing you to stick to your knitting in terms of what you do and not letting feature creep sort of drag you away from your mission. And so our constraint where we have um, sort of ring fenced ourselves for now is around this early stage. So given that we are sort of playing in a very particular box from a check signers point of view, we are a, a generalist firm, like meaning we are not bound by one particular vertical or area that we invest in. And that said, um, we have a number of verticals that we like and a number of business models that we are extremely interested in and that we are passionate about and believe in. And so we basically invest at the intersection of verticals that we are in uh, that we like and business models that we believe in. And we try and do that in a somewhat systematic way. And it's, uh, by the way, these things can evolve and change over time. Like you got to skate to where the puck is going in this business. But but we have a, a pretty um, a pretty good way of sort of cutting the world today to make sure that in being a generalist early stage firm, we're not just running around like headless chickens chasing whatever the hot thing is. So we kind of slice the world initially through business models. So there are basically four business models that we spend our time on. One is consumer. And by the way, the, the generalist part of our firm also maps to my interests, right? And I think it maps to um, what the folks that join our team appreciate about us. I am a very curious person. I don't, I, I, I like having my hand in different pots. That's why I am in venture capital to begin with. And I like to be able to go deep in different areas and, um, don't like to pit, be pigeonholed into like I only do this one thing and this very narrow thing, and so the way the way that we have defined the landscape is so we have four uh, business models that we like. We, we like consumer businesses that can scale. I've been doing consumer for a long time. Emma on our team's been doing consumer for a long time. We're always looking for big, scalable, cons- vertical consumer ideas. They're fewer fewer and far. They're in between, but we do them when we see them. We we really like um, product led SaaS. So uh, you know, API uh, Plaid and Sift were product led companies that I did at Spark. I've always Vimeo is a one of the first freemium software businesses in the world. Really, I have always. Uh, um, enjoyed software businesses that lead with product rather than with sales. So we we do SaaS investing, but with a product led mindset. That's another business model. And then the other two are what we've been talking about. Really, uh, well, one is what we're talking about, and the other is the thing that's gonna that, that's gonna change all of this and the conversation we're gonna be having in 10, 10 years, which is fin, fintech and crypto. Right. So I have done a lot in fintech over the years. I've from 1.0 to 2.0 to now 3.0. And so the business models we love are either scalable, vertical, consumer uh, business models, product-led SaaS approaches that are very sticky and durable, um, fintech, which is Im- increasingly embedded finance, and then crypto. And, and in crypto, it's really like as we move to a Web3 world, Where are the places germane that we can play at Shine? And then we'll look at that against verticals that we really like. And it's not to say that we won't work in other verticals, because we will if we find a great product-led growth, SaaS business in a vertical that we really like outside of these buckets, we'll do it too. But if you take the vertical slice, where we're spending most of our time is around climate and Every everything around that. So whether it's the food ecosystem or the building ecosystem, etc. Like, what is what does climate change mean for um, vertical opportunities? Health and wellness, and then a lot of these larger sort of B two B markets, as we've talked about. So we've spent a little time in trucking. We've spent some time in construction. We've spent some time. Um, 
like developer tools and infrastructure around the operating systems? So I was going to I was about to go to developer tools and infrastructure. That was the next thing, but more so from a PLG SaaS sort of one level. We're not really doing deep deep infrastructure, but we're thinking about, you know, developers as a vertical unto themselves, developers, product people, like the the folks that are driving software businesses forward today as a vertical unto themselves as well. And we look at the intersection of these things. We will look at, you know, businesses that are applying business models that we like against um, in a vertical that we think is untapped. And we'll work as a team and leverage all, all the respective strengths of everybody on our team in each relevant area to to hunt for and find opportunities that make sense for us. But again, those are pretty big categories. Like what we've been working on as a firm is sort of picking our spots within those areas where we think we can, we have interest, we can play and we can win. And so, and in fact, you, you know, you caught me, uh, as we're going through that exercise, I was just talking to the team earlier today about taking sort of the business models we like and the verticals that we've been spending most of our time in and trying to be a little more thoughtful in how we map those things, figure out the intersection of those things and hunt for opportunities there. So like in some of the, the more B2B verticals that we're talking about, it's mostly around software and embedded fintech, right? In climate, it could be anything from thinking about carbon as a priced asset and what does that look like? And there could be marketplace opportunities about around that. There could be fintech opportunities, fintech marketplace opportunities around that. There could be crypto opportunities around that, you know, or we'll look at like PLG or SaaS or whatever it is. Uh, like we'll look at software and then we'll think about, okay, where where are the areas where um, vertical software, like you could look at health and wellness and there's been a lot happening in healthcare around uh, really bringing software to that vertical in a more um, bottoms up way, um, thinking about uh, all these different verticals in that ecosystem. You could think about providers, you could think about patients. So again, like it, 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 we, we start sort of broad and we narrow our focus internally to make sure that everybody's spending time in an area where they have a real point of view on what an opportunity might look like. And they really continue to pull on that string. Um, but also, you know, we talked about this again earlier today, kind of the old Google 80, 20 rule where I also want folks just, and this is when I say folks, myself included, finding the most talented people we can um, and chasing them down and, you know, backing people with really, really big visions. And so there's there's a certain amount of serendipity in this business, as you know, that yes, you have to put yourself in front of the right opportunities, um, but you also have to have your mind open, so to speak, to to see brilliance and 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 really boundary pushing ideas when you come your way when they come your way and that's you know a tough balance but we try and do a mix of both top down focused thesis and thematic investing with while never losing our openness to and um and ability to move quickly when serendipity comes our way. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, that's why we see uh, a lot of things together with you. We, we enjoy working with you guys at Shine because we see the world in the same way. And you've been an incredible mentor and advisor to me as an emerging manager, you know, just the same way that, you know, Fred was to you. And that's some great advice that Fred shared with you. And, you know, I really do enjoy looking at the world in the same lens that you guys have. And hopefully we can find more opportunities to work on together. But before we wrap things up, I'd love to ask you for uh, your fast favorites, where I list off five categories and you name your favorite of each one. So first one is your favorite podcast? I got to say, I'm going to go with Joe Rogan because he gives no fucks. I <laughs> love that. Favorite newsletter or blog? AVC. Favorite tech gadget? You know what my favorite tech gadget is right now, believe it or not? It's my Hypervolt. Ah, love that. Nice. 
I'm at the age where <laughs> having a hyper vote handy is extremely important. Everything hurts. I know it's like a toothbrush. Favorite new trend? Crypto. Crypto is rewiring the world. Yep. And last but not least, favorite book? You know, the truth of the matter is my favorite books to this day are still like, I would still put like Portnoy's Complaint by Philip Roth up there as potentially my favorite book of all time. I'm a sucker for fiction. I know most of the people in our line of work read a lot of nonfiction and I do as well. But I was both a finance and English major in college. And, um, you know, to me, beautiful nonfiction is it's a work of art in in a way that you just can't get with uh, nonfiction. And I'll also shout out that my my dear friend and former colleague, Jeremy Phillips at Spark, has really pushed me in this direction. But I've read a lot of Murakami over the last couple of years, and I'm a big, big um, Murakami fan as well. Just the, the tone, the style, the way he uses words to capture character, sentiment, personality is just sort of breathtaking. So I'm a big, big fan. No, I love it. Thank you for sharing the softer side of you, Mo. And thanks for joining us in the tank today to discuss embedded fintech as the new SaaS 3.0 with Mo Kaufman from Shine Capital. Thank you, Matt. Great to talk to you. Thanks for listening to another episode of Tank Talks. To learn more about this episode, be sure to go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify to find more detailed notes on this episode or to check out previous episodes. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review and a rating as it helps us out a lot. And hit that subscribe button so you can get notified when new episodes come out. Finally, make sure to give me a follow on Twitter at Matty B. Cohen or at Tank Talk Podcast to stay up to date on new episodes or to be a guest on our show. Till next time, 